My name is Basia. Um, I just have the most primitive question. I don't know what a toxic plume is. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> what it contains, how it how it functions, how it, a plume enters the water, and things like that. Mm, okay. Just briefly. Yeah. If someone has money for a cordless mic, <laughs> yeah, there you go. How about two mics? One for the crowd and one for me. Yeah. That'd be fun. Um, by plume, what I mean is, uh, the, the important thing to know is that the condition of the river is transient. It's not steady state. So you have sort of the normal flow condition of the river, and then every time it rains, and a, 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 some amount of water comes rushing down these canyons and into the river. And particularly the plume, or the, the, the water that rushes down Los Alamos Canyon and into the river, that water entering the river has much higher concentrations of toxins, and that those toxins stay in a little plume that then floats down river. Of course, over time, it dissipates into the river and becomes the, the condition of the river again. So the point is, at certain times, there's a spike. If you were just to measure the river continuously, at certain times, there is a spike in the level of a number of contaminants in the river. And the critical thing is to not draw the water during a spike. And that's what I'm claiming there hasn't been reliability engineering on. Anyone on this side of the second row before I go to the right? We should switch to the back so those people don't get tired. This is just kind of a clarification for a few things that Mark and others have spoken about. First, the water um, that comes from the Buckman Direct Diversion, um, if it's got coarse sediment, the sediment is removed close to the river. If there is turbidity, or suspended particles in the water that makes it look milky, and that is the kind of stuff that uranium and plutonium can attach itself to, is that turbidity. There's nothing to remove that turbidity until it gets to the water treatment plant, which is about five or six miles away. So all of that potentially radioactive water goes through the pipeline, and it is removed at the water treatment plant. There is a flocking agent that removes that turbidity at the water treatment plant, that material then is hauled to the landfill. That doesn't do anything with whatever material may have been uh, left within the pipes. This is from the people that run the Buckman Direct Diversion. This is from their staff. This isn't my quotes. This is what they explained to me, how the system works in response to my particular questions. Why is turbidity important? Why is suspended particles important? Thursday night, many of us, several of us, were at the uh, Lionel Stormwater Permit at the City of Gold Casino Conference Center, and they presented all this information about how they're uh, mitigating stormwater runoff through the landfill properties. One of the things that they showed up on their boards as well as in their slide presentation was what they called best management practices. Best management practices are like small retention basins, uh, dams, things along those lines. In the drawings, they show that some of those best management practices actually failed after the fire, where the waters rushed through the area, small areas were covered up with the, the ash and sediment and what have you. And after listening to all of this, I spoke at the end of that presentation and I cited my experience in Wyoming after the 1988 fires, where I observed the huge forest fires and subsequent storm events that washed down wiped out wetlands, filled in lakes. One of the pictures on their boards Thursday night was from the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest of a large storm event there, and how the best management practices failed in that regard and roads were washed out. Well, I lived there during those storm events. I saw that as well. And when I asked them specifically, what are you doing about those kinds of things, the large storm events, not the little things that they were showing how they were going to mitigate, their answer was, as Joni will attest, the guy said, luck six or seven times and hope two or three times. <laughs> and the answer to him was, well, I hope you are lucky. But in the meantime, I ask that you put some safeguards into effect for those large catastrophic storm events. I use the example of what happened at the Dixon Orchard, what happened at the Priolais Canyon when Bandelier had all that boulders and trees washing down through that area. That's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That's where the turbidity in the water comes from that's not going to be removed until it gets to the water treatment plant. Thanks, Michael. Now, 
We'll keep comments pretty short because I want to get to everybody if we can. Do you want to work back, Maurice? Just, yeah. I think, in third row or behind baby. Let's go to the back and work forward. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Yeah, I, I just like to question, uh, even without Buckman, what about uh, just if, if the river was never touched, and we're not talking about runoff, what about seepage? What about, you know, I've, it, it's been, what, 50 years? So how, is our, how are our water tables? Are there any toxic plumes in our water tables? Uh, you know, what about that? Uh, if, uh, you know, there could be all kinds of particulate crap down there, even before we get to Buckman. Buckman's like... Uh, it's an insult to injury or an insult to less injury, whatever question. A little bit dangerously, since I'm not a hydrologist, I'll talk about it. It's known that the surface water systems and the subsurface water systems are connected, right? Everybody's pretty clear on that concept. And then the tritium detects I was talking about are in the wells, so we are already talking about tritium detections down in the water wells subsurface. And then there were plutonium detects in 2006 and or 2008. Joni can give you details on those. But so there already has been have been contaminants found in the subsurface, and we know they're in the surface. So, you know. I forgot to mention I'm a cancer survivor a couple of years ago. So I've lived here since '71. So I've been drinking this water. Yeah. 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 Joni, do, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um. So directly east of the Buckman Diversion Project and the wells is a plume of hexavalent chromium that was discovered in, that was reported in 2004. In the well, yeah. N no, in the regional aquifer uh -huh. on the west side of the river in Sandia Canyon. It was reported at 400 parts per billion. The state standard is 50 parts per billion. The EPA standard is 100 parts per billion. That plume has now grown in concentration to 1,200 parts per billion. And while the governor says that stormwater and surface water and groundwater are the priority, yet she put a cleaver into the um, consent order, basically extending the deadlines for addressing these issues of two years, um, that, that contamination is continuing to grow in concentration. On Thursday, no, on Friday, we found out that the laboratory's proposing to do a pump test of some of the wells in that area where the chromium plume is, and they want to discharge about 500,000 gallons of water. So we're in the process. This is some of the work that we do. We're in contact with the Environment Department. Let's see the application that Lanel's <laughs> submitting to be able to do this in the area of the chromium plume. Um, we're very concerned about what that even means. We have, all we've seen is the link in the electronic database um, that says that they've asked for, they've submitted a permit. The concern is, is that hexavalent chromium, which is the contaminant of concern in Aaron Brockovich, is that it's a fast moving, like tritium, it may be the front of a plume. Um, with respect to the groundwater wells, they're all impacted. Basically, all of the wells are impacted with bentonite clay or other organic drilling fluids that bind up the contamination so that the samples that are being uh, collected are not representative of what's actually happening in, in the groundwater. So it's really important. What My message of hope is, is to ask you to please get involved in this issue. It's very complex. It's the surface water. It's the groundwater. Lanel own computer modeling shows that when we drilled the five new wells during the drought of 2000, that the Kona Depression, which is the recharge area for the Buckman area, before we drilled the five new wells, the Kona Depression was only on our side of the river. But once we drilled those new wells, the area of recharge actually goes across the river onto the west side. Mm -hmm. So we may be drawing contaminated water to our wells. So these early warnings of the tritium, and Mark's work is, is just so important because tritium, as he described, is hydrogen-tritiated water. So it just moves with the, the groundwater flow. It's soluble in water. And it's soluble in water. And what happens is, is that, you know, we've had this disagreement with 
the laboratory for over a decade about the, the flow, the measurements of the flow <coughs> through this. They say it's just, you know, itty bitty. And we're saying, I don't remember the number, but um, George Rice, a groundwater hydrologist, said that um, contaminated water could travel eight miles in less than 24 years and maybe as less as of a decade. So we have these contaminants coming out of these discharge pipes in the canyons that are flowing. Um, I'll stop there. There's more things to say, but um, 